When a company provides a good or service, they charge money for it. When you consume it, you pay for it. The same goes with housing. Those evil and greedy landlords provide housing and tenants pay a market rate for it. Since housing is a need for everyone, bad landlords do exist. And unfortunately, the market is not efficient enough to wipe all of them completely out of business, which leads to episodes like this recent one on Patriot Act by Hasan Minhaj. People aren't worried about 18 months. They're worried about this month because this month is when rent is due. If you're gonna shelter in place, you kinda need the shelter part. And right now, renters are way more vulnerable than homeowners. Videos like this try to separate landlords from tenants. It provides a very powerful us versus them narrative. A better way to word this would be that we are all vulnerable. Landlords have more fixed costs, responsibilities, and operating expenses than renters. I understand that renters are being challenged to pay for rent during these trying times, but landlords have expenses too. If anything needs repair, who do you think pays for it and where do you think the money comes from? The landlord better have the money if that AC goes out. I showed in a recent video that I had 30 cents in my account the other day. I lost my job and I'm paying for about $3,000 in repairs for this house so that all of my tenants can feel more comfortable during the Vegas summer heat. These expenses were not mandatory, but that's part of ownership and we need rent in order to pay all of our bills and operating expenses. If landlords lose housing, then that decreases the supply of housing in a market, which leads to more expensive living for those renters. Instead of separating the two, I think it would be much more responsible of him and people with a lot of influence to recognize that renters and landlords are both in a position where they're very vulnerable right now. People with huge audience should be promoting community and finding solutions together so that we can get through this period together as one. By splitting the two, you're instantly creating division between landlords and tenants. And worse, episodes like this one put landlords in such a bad light, even though we risk so much of our money, time, and energy into providing housing for renters. Over 100 million Americans live in rental units. And in April, 2.3 million households did not pay any rent Data like this is very misleading. This is very incomplete data because he's positioning his argument as if 2.3 million households do not have money to pay rent. What we do need to know is how many of these households were unable to pay rent because a loss of job and a lack of assistance from the government because it's an entirely different set of data if some percentage of these households received money from the government, they received money from stimulus, or they were still employed and decided not to pay rent. Choosing to pay rent is much different than not being able to afford rent. Let's look at this data differently. If out of the 2.3 million households, maybe 1.8 million of those people actually had the money to pay rent, but they decided not to to take advantage of the situation, this would be a much different conversation, wouldn't it? Even giant corporations aren't paying up. Subway, Nordstrom, H&M, Staples, Urban Outfitters, and the Cheesecake Factory have said they're not paying full rent during COVID-19. This is actually a very nuanced conversation to have. Do you think that businesses should be treated differently than residential tenants? In my opinion, I think it depends on how much assistance they get. If they're forced to shut their doors, shut down their business, and they can't operate as normal, then they shouldn't get evicted. Same with residential tenants. You take away their jobs, you take away their ability to earn an income, then they shouldn't get evicted. The difference in my opinion is that residential tenants are receiving assistance to pay their rent. And if they choose to not pay rent, even though they do have rent, then they should be opening themselves up to the ability to get evicted. Giant corporations have leverage to negotiate with their landlords, but you don't. And your future depends on your landlord's generosity. He's definitely right about this. And this is why I wish people with influence would begin promoting community and solving these problems together. I am a very pro-tenant landlord. I dropped rents for four out of my six tenants during this COVID crisis because I wanted to make it easier on everyone. And the other two were already paying less than market rate. So I feel like I've been very fair during these trying times, but not all landlords are gonna be willing to work with tenants the way I have. And this is unfortunate because this is why I'm very pro-tenant. I think all small landlords should be communicating with their tenants to come up with ways for both parties to find solutions to get through this event together. What I want people to understand about being a landlord is that a lot of tenants are incredibly flaky, irresponsible, and since some of them don't care about credit, they'll just up and leave without any leverage on your part. So the ideal situation is that you can come up with some agreement where you extend the lease maybe another 12 or 24 months or something and you add a very nominal expense every month to help cover what they owe. That would be ideal, but understand that pushing rent for another 12 months on some people might not work out because they might be flaky and they might be the type to 
After a couple months, they just kind of say, oh yeah, you know, we have an agreement, but then they just leave, leaving with you holding the bag. And what I think happens long-term with a lot of landlords is that they lose trust with tenants and it disincentivizes them to try to come up with a long-term game plan that's fair to both sides. There's some landlords like Brooklyn's Mario Salerno who waived April rent for all of his tenants. That's a very kind gesture for this landlord, but understand that all landlords are not able to do this and simply can't afford to do this. Even though tenants seem to think that landlords make you know, all this money taking advantage of all those poor tenants, that's simply not the case. As we'll discuss later, majority of landlords are actually small time landlords and earning a very small amount from renting out a property. A lot of landlords are taking his approach. In Queens, tenants got an email saying, COVID is terrible, however, Rent is still due. I'm not sure why he included this email as both tenants and landlords have contracts signed regarding payments. Landlords typically have many. Landlords aren't getting one bill removed from their balance sheet. It may sound like forbearance allows the landlord to kind of get off free, mortgage free for a month while the poor renter has to pay, but it's simply pushing it to a later date so they don't get a free month and therefore I don't believe that the renter should get a free month as well. This is why tenants all across the nation are fed up. From Los Angeles, Philadelphia to New York, tens of thousands of tenants banded together in the largest coordinated rent strike in decades. And I'm planning not to pay the, the next month, which is May. And why is that? Because I have to choose between paying rent or buying food for my family. I really dislike this segment. If someone lost their job and they haven't been able to receive government assistance, then I can understand their frustration and their inability to pay rent. In that situation, I absolutely do not believe that they should be getting evicted. But my question is, did these people receive the stimulus checks to aid with paying their bills? or were they able to acquire assistance in the form of unemployment? If they are still employed, which right now is still like 75% of the country, if they have been able to receive assistance and they have the money to pay rent, then personally, I think they should be paying rent. The stimulus checks were sent out a little more than a month ago and the federal government has been adding $600 a week on top of the state's unemployment so that these tenants can pay their bills. Renters are contractually obligated to pay rent if they have the money then they need to pay. This is what being a responsible adult entails. It's the same with being a landlord. If you have the money, you should be paying all of your bills. With that said, if renters are unable to pay the rent, I think the landlord should start reaching out to them, communicating with them really well and coming to a solution mutually because we do not wanna see people not able to feed their families and lose their housing. Think about it, if we hit 25% unemployment, we still have 75% of the workforce working. The real argument is dealing with people who have lost their job, were not able to receive the stimulus checks yet and have not been able to find unemployment. Those are the people we need to be helping. The editing of this show makes it sound like renters nationwide just can't pay rent and all they have is enough money for food for their families. I think it would be way more responsible to figure out why they can't pay rent and come up with solutions to talk to the landlord or to find out why they haven't been able to receive unemployment and hopefully be able to come up with a solution either way so that we can continue moving forward. By holding out on rent, Americans across the country are trying to pressure federal and state governments to cancel rent. That means the rent piling up during COVID would never have to be paid. Tools clear history, which would be great for tenants, but canceling rent has a lot of downstream effects. Canceling rents would be one of the worst things the government could do. He brings up the domino effect this would cause and I'm glad he did. I want those who follow these kinds of shows to understand that a large percentage of landlords are small time investors in what you would call accidental landlords. These are the people that you know buy a house and then after a couple years or a few years, they end up having to move out to switch to a new job, career, or they just wanna move out and they leave the house to rent. Not receiving rent for a month or two would wipe out so many landlords. And when mom and pop landlords start leaving the marketplace and institutional investors come in and these large property managers are taking over, this is when you have the lack of communication between both people because generally the larger that they get, the more likely that it'll lead to eviction and not wanting to work with the renter. Eviction is the crisis coming after the crisis. Without massive federal intervention, millions of Americans are going to be evicted who don't deserve it. I think we're gonna see a lot of people leave the large apartment complexes where you're sharing walls with strangers and sharing amenities to living in houses. I think a lot of single people might actually shift into sharing a house with roommates because of the savings potential. And I think a lot of people are now seeing the value of spending less, paying off debt, living frugally, and having a little cash in the bank. And moving into a house with roommates is generally the first step in really improving personal finances. But that's exactly what some landlords are doing right now, even in places where courts are closed. It is illegal to evict 
a tenant without a judge's order. Reports of self-help evictions are increasing. That's when a landlord tries to evict the tenant by shutting off utilities, changing the locks, or removing belongings. Do you hear that? An illegal eviction is called a self-help eviction. I hope landlords and investors who are operating their business unethically are wiped out following this period by losing good renters and essentially not being able to find new renters to take their place. I'm glad he brings up that renters can use implied warranty of habitability to come after landlords who perform unethical business practices on their living situation. It's unfortunate that most renters probably aren't aware of this clause, but if you are, you can generally sue your landlord or receive rent for the months where your dwelling unit was not livable. Last month, the Wall Street Journal said some investors believe this pandemic is a once in a generation opportunity to buy real estate at bargain prices. Ah yes, kind of like how Hurricane Katrina was a once in a generation opportunity to swim down Bourbon Street. Here's where I really dislike the rhetoric used, including this tangent makes no sense because bargain prices indicate that real estate assets will be affordable for possibly the first time in a few years. He's very pro renter in this video, so it actually make more sense for him to try and uplift the viewer into home ownership so they can control their living situation and not have to worry about those evil, greedy landlords. If real estate assets do become heavily discounted, then this might actually be a once in a generation opportunity for people out there who have been struggling to afford a home. They might actually be able to qualify for a home for the first time in a few years. He brings up the idea that evictions are still happening during COVID. According to Ballotpedia.org, all 50 states have suspended in-person proceedings statewide or at the local level. I don't know about every city, but here in Las Vegas, and I'd imagine essentially everywhere else, you can't evict during this time. It's not going to happen because the courts are closed. There is no specific data available of how many landlords are small time landlords and how many are big institutional investors. What I found though is a resource called HUDUser.gov. About 22.7 million units out of 48.5 million rental units are owned by individuals. That's 46.8%. The other 53.2% are owned by companies. But understand that a lot of small time investors own rental property in their LLC. So I think it's safe to say that a majority of rental units are actually owned by small time investors versus large institutional companies. You can communicate with small time investors a lot easier than large property managers and large institutional investing firms. They are also on average more likely to work with you on paying rent late and also not dealing with evictions. I hope all bad operators running businesses unethically get wiped out after this period. I really do. Episodes like this one don't help though. It creates more of a divide between renters and landlords and I do think it kind of creates a little bitterness on both sides at the looking at the other party. I think the best path forward is finding solutions for both parties so that we can get through this mess together. The best solution is one where tenants aren't getting evicted and landlords are able to pay their bills to continue providing housing, which is still in short supply. Thanks so much for watching.